more um, about impactful OER communication. Thanks so much, Misha. Absolutely, and thanks so much for, for having us today, and, and good afternoon. Um, as Beck has said, um, we are thrilled to be talking with you today about how communications can advance the work that you do in open educational resources. Um, you know, what will, we've structured our time so that we'll get to know, you'll get to know us a little bit better, we'll get to know you, uh, and then talk about audience um, and who you're trying to reach how you reach them through message uh, messaging and kind of having a discussion around that. Um, and then the ways in which you reach them, all the tools in your, your toolkit. So essentially, you know, who are you trying to talk to? Um, what should you be saying or could you be saying? And then how are the ways in which you can say that? Um, and definitely, you know, want um, to, to hear questions and thoughts along the way. Uh, before uh, I get too much farther, though, let me talk a little bit about GMMB. Um, so we are a communications agency that is mission-driven and full service. So mission-driven, what in the world does that mean? Uh, well, our partners years ago, um, you know, come from um, the political campaign world, where it's never good enough just for somebody to know um, who your candidate is. They also need to know, um, you know, we need them to do something, right? Namely, go vote. So when voting, you know, that is behavior change. So our partners thought, well, why not take those kinds of skills that, um, you know, our broadcast capabilities, our digital capabilities, our working with reporters, our messaging, and apply them toward the issues that we care about. So that's where um, we really are mission driven. We work in the areas, uh, just to name a few, of healthcare, climate change, and education. We do have a dedicated education practice. Um, and as kind of Martin alluded to, uh, we've had the, the distinct pleasure of working on behalf of the OER community for um, a bit more than four years now through our work um, with the Hewlett Foundation. So now I would love to, to get to know you all a bit better. And again, my, my colleague Kelsey will join um, when she is able. Uh, but if you wouldn't mind, you know, putting in the chat um, your name, your research focus, and if there is a specific question around communications um, or challenge that you'd like us to cover, um, would very much like to see that. I'm gonna see if I can figure out how to see the chat as I <laughs> am now in the presenter mode. Hey Michelle, can you hear me? I can hear you. Welcome, Kelsey. Everybody has known that um, the the techni technology goblins have gotten into your computer. <laughs> <laughs> I am on. I am on on my personal computer now. So I'm so sorry um, to be late, but really happy to join uh, now. All right, and we're having folks um, in the chat kind of share their name focus and any comms questions. And I see folks furiously typing away. Give another minute. Negative stories, okay. New narratives. Welcome, Verena. Like what concerns? Satya. Right.
of the pitfalls. Igor, that's great. Not overwhelming is key. <laughs> All right, I want to just give folks another minute before we keep moving. And um, Kelsey will be taking this from here, but I'll keep an eye on the chat as we go um, so that we don't lose any of these great thoughts. Great. So I think I'll actually cover this during my presentation, um, but we do have time for questions at the end, so we'll get to any questions that I didn't cover um, at that time, but these are all really, really great questions. Um, so I'm gonna start right now and talk a little bit about audiences because successful communications um, really needs to be audience centered. And you've already started thinking about this. I can tell by the chat, um, you know, how do we make things simple? How do we make it easily digestible and understandable? And really, it can be helpful to start by really thinking about the audience perspective. Where are they coming from? What's their mindset right now? What will resonate with them? And where are they getting their information? Are, are they online? Are they talking to peers? Um, what does that look like for them? Kind of what, what's their world? So the first step when starting to plan communications is defining your audience and thinking about your audience. So when it comes to OER, maybe it's a student, a teacher, could be a policy leader, an advocate, a professor, um, or an administrator. Across K through 12 or higher ed, it looks like we have um, a good span of, of different research topics and areas that you all are focused on, um, which, is, which is excellent. But really, it's about defining that audience and thinking, what do they already know about OER? Where are they starting? So if you start clicking through on our slide, um, see some of those audience examples and the three kind of levels of um, awareness or, or knowledge about OER that um, we identified through research. And this, the research we um, have conducted is primarily US-based. Um, as Michelle mentioned, we are based in the US and that has been our, our focus area. Um, but we do think that it is applicable um, across the board. Um, in in other countries as well and we lost our powerpoint did we lose michelle oh no did michelle get booted off yeah i think oh dear we are just full of technical issues today sorry folks just one minute Hi, Michelle. Holy smokes. <laughs> I'm, I'm coming right back. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Um, I, while you're pulling up the deck again, I'm just going to keep um, cruising through. We've got our audience yep. examples up on the screen here. Um, so I'm talking about thinking about where your audience is in terms of awareness of OER. So we know in the US and certainly around the world, um, most educators still really don't know what OER are. Maybe they've heard the term, um, maybe they've heard that they have a peer using resources or maybe a neighboring university, um, but they might they probably aren't using the resources themselves um, and they probably don't have a nuanced understanding of open licensing or really what the benefits of uh, OER are for their teaching and for their students. Okay, we're back up and running here. Okay, so there's our first level awareness. Our second level is engagement. So some, some people are using OER, maybe they're newer to um, this type of, of material, this type of teaching and learning, um, but they're starting to engage with it and, and starting to see the benefits for their students um, and their teaching practices. And then the third level, um, which, which is the smallest group, is 
the advocate. So they're using OER and they really love it. They want their peers to be using it and um, they're, they're taking steps to spread the word and help others understand the concept and adopt it into their classrooms. Um, what we know from research is that once the majority of educators are, are using OER, they actually often go from engagement to advocacy relatively quickly. It, it, it's the type of thing where once they, they are getting their hands on it, they really start to see the benefits and they really start to um, become advocates and, and want to spread the word about it. So the challenge is really those who aren't aware of it or who really don't understand the nuances around it, um, making, making it clear to them and helping them go from awareness to adoption. But again, when we're thinking about where most people are, it really is in that awareness um, category. So one of the helpful ways we can ground ourselves in the audience mindset is by creating a user persona. And this doesn't need to be too formal, but it, it is helpful to just kind of put down on paper um, who your audience is, is. It could be multiple people. It could be, um, doesn't even have to be a specific person like we have here, but, but kind of an example of a type of person. So here we have on the screen, uh, Catherine. This is a user persona that we're gonna take a look at now. And um, Catherine is hired faculty at a small university and she wants to find resources to increase student engagement. And she has heard about OER, but doesn't really fully understand the connection between OER and student engagement or the benefits of OER or really where to find the materials. So a lot for Catherine is going to be new. Based off of what we know about Catherine, we can then start to think about, well, how will she learn about OER? What kind of communications um, will move her to try out the materials? And what we can infer is that she really needs readable, clear, actionable content. So she's busy, she doesn't have a lot of extra time on her hands, but she will spend the time to, to dive into something that is, is clear and straightforward. Um, and, and she sees how it could be in the benefit of, of her student learning. She's an analytical thinker. Um, data is important to her. So outcomes and impact data on the benefits of OER um, is something that will help her understand and, and want to use it in her classroom. But she will also likely be convinced through stories. So examples from classrooms that are similar to hers, um, really something that can help paint a picture of how OER can work um, and how it could change teaching and learning. And she's, she's likely aware of larger issues that may impact her student success. Um, anything from different styles of learning um, to the impacts of systemic racism. So all these larger topics that are are happening um, in conversations around the world and OER can be a part of the solution to these larger challenges. Um, so that might be something that she's thinking about uh, and convinced by as well. So these first four bullets are really about the what, what kind of information will resonate with Catherine, um, but it's also really important to think about who, who is a trusted messenger to her, where is she getting information from, um, and that's likely from her university, from the administration, from peers, other professors, other faculty members, and it's probably online. So she's probably um, using email, seeing what comes through on that platform. She's probably using Wikipedia. She's Googling around, trying to just see what she can find about these resources. Um, and she's probably on social media, LinkedIn and Twitter may be her top platforms. So this is, again, an example of uh, thinking about the audience first um, and, and then designing your communications with that perspective top of mind um, so that you know you, you're creating something that will, will get to Catherine or will get to whoever your audience is at the end of the day. So we're going to dive into some guiding principles for OER communication and really try to keep Catherine top of mind as we're going through these, thinking about you know, these are general principles, but we're really going to use them to, to try to reach the specific audience that um, is our end goal. Some of these are going to be somewhat obvious, but just really important to, to focus in and, and have top of mind as you're thinking about your OER communications. Um, so the first one is 
make OER specific and tangible. And this really gets to the point um, that most people don't know about OER. They don't know the nuances of OER. Even those who are familiar with the term, there, there probably is fuzziness somewhere about the concept. So it's really important to use the full term, open educational resources, definitely on the first reference, but could be more than the first reference, whether it's written communications or oral communications. Um, and think about ways that you can make it tangible, bring in stories and examples throughout your communications to really bring OER to life. Really, the more specific examples um, and tangible examples you have, the better. One way to make OER tangible, but really also something we recommend leading with um, as part of your definition is how open educational resources are different from other materials. So um, in some ways they, they can function like proprietary content, but really the benefits and, and the differences are what is most important to highlight. So the ways that OER are unique, compelling, how they engage students and energize the classroom, um, the fact that they're guided by the idea of, of uh, making sure everyone has access to high quality resources and, um, and why open licensing allows that to, to be the case. So this is um, really the five R's I'm talking about here, but, but explaining them in a way that that's not wonky um, and that is, there's clearly classroom applications to them. Um, and they're different from proprietary materials. We also want to put students at the center. And as you're thinking through all of this, at the end of the day, who is the end beneficiary of open educational resources? Um, oftentimes educators, but, but really in service of students and in service of learning. So um, really trying to, to tease out and highlight, at the end of the day, what are the benefits to students? Um, and then again, I noted this when we were talking about what might resonate with Catherine, but um, thinking about how OER may connect to different issues broader than, than specific curriculum, specific uh, pedagogy, things like equity, things like deeper learning, um, culturally relevant instruction, these larger concepts that OER can be in support of. And on the next slide, yep, we can keep going. Um, I do want to, to definitely highlight this first bullet, um, how important it is to talk about OER in connection with quality because, and, and I know this was a question that came in in the chat, what are, what are the critiques that are out there about OER? And this is certainly one that can rise to the top. Questions around, well, if a resource is free and it's online, like doesn't that mean anybody could put an open license on something and it becomes an OER? And the answer is, well, yes, but there are an, there's an incredible wealth of really high quality, highly vetted um, resources that are out there. And so it's important to, to make sure that's understood and, and show exactly how that is possible. So the types of institutions authors who are creating OER, um, what the vetting process actually looks like, the fact that there has there's a number of um, independent curriculum reviewers like Ed Reports um, that are taking a look at these resources and, and really finding them to be quite high quality. So um, talking about OER in the context of high quality, but defining how it, how it comes to be that a resource gets that label. Um, Another critique that can come up is how OER, um, you know, kind of the fear that OER are not easy to use, that they add a lot of time in an educator's life um, because you're switching from something proprietary that might just be by the book, ready to go, rip and use the material versus OER where in some cases you might need to um, find the materials, you might need to edit, remix, it, it can be a bit scary for educators to think about taking on that extra work. So really emphasizing OER can be easily used. There are many that exist out there um, that are either ready to go or 
require minimal work, um, or maybe there is a bit of front end work, but the result in terms of student success is, is above and beyond and well worth taking the time to remix, to personalize it, you know, whatever an educator might be doing to a resource. Um, and then I think really, again, the credentials, um, raising that up about OER is it speaks to the point about quality and where, um, where resources are coming from. And then the last thing I, I will say when we're thinking about principles is um, some additional pitfalls to think about. So um, educators can get turned off by messages that claim OER is kind of the silver bullet solution to everything, to all issues that we may be facing in education in different parts of the world, just you know, use OER and all of a sudden all your problems are solved. So that's definitely not something that educators are receptive to. We wanna make sure that it's clear OER is a tool to accomplish many goals and, and it is, it is quite useful, it has many benefits, but it's not gonna be just a panacea of solutions to everything. And then the second is um, talking about OER in the context of traditional textbooks. And it's, you know, while I've said, it's really important to um, lead with how OER are different from traditional materials and um, make it clear why they're why they are different. The reality is that many educators are using proprietary materials and often pulling in OER maybe for part of um, their course offering, probably not the full course, although of course in many cases educators are using um, OER for everything. But um, really the idea is is often OER are working in partnership with traditional materials and so um, messaging that goes really hard against traditional materials and you know tries to discredit them, tries to say you have to use OER for everything. Um, it, it isn't going to resonate with many educators because the reality for them is they are still using traditional materials to some extent. So we're going to take a look at some sample messaging and the messaging that we put together here um, again, based off of research, is really a compilation of the guiding principles that I just shared. So here's how we have taken um, what we've learned talking to educators and made it simple, made it straightforward, and, and tried to um, have a description of OER that is um, pulling all those different principles together and, and making it really, really clear. So I'll read it out loud. Um, guided by the idea that high quality mm -hmm. educational materials should be available to everyone, open educational resources are educational materials that are free for educators and students to use, customize, and share. OER's open licensing makes it easy to personalize everything from a single lesson to an entire textbook and engage students with contents that's fresh and relevant. So this is messaging that we have put together and um, we're using it in the US and, and working with, with folks across um, can the OER community to, to share this message and incorporate it into their communications. But I'm very curious to just take a pause here for a minute and um, hear a little bit about what this messaging sounds like to you. Is this similar to what you might hear, what you might think is useful in your part of the world? Um, are there, is there anything that might be different about either a messaging block I just shared or the guiding principles where you say, you think, well, this actually might play a little bit differently in my context and, and here's why. Um, so we'd love to either hear in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself and chime in, um, what, what is this messaging? Um, is this, is this useful to you? Is this something you might use in your part of the world? Oh, that's a great question. Um, Michelle, can you just pop back one slide so we can display the messaging mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, folks can react to it? Mm -hmm. 
sure you get some good messages coming in in the chat. Um, and it looks like someone might be unmuted. If you have any thoughts, please feel free to chime in. So just to add in, I think I need to enable people's mics. So if you do want to speak, just let us know and I can do that. I'll unlock everyone's microphone. Great. It looks like generally what we're getting is is the idea that this is this will work in a number of contexts. That this is this is messaging that that makes sense um, where you're located. Marina, I think you are muted now. If you wanted to. Thanks, Bex. <laughs> I just, I just want to say, yeah, I'm, so I'm in Canada. Um, I think, agree with Martin that the, I like that you pointed out that the silver bullet is important and, and not make this the saving grace. On the other hand, I liked how you pointed out, look at the bigger picture, make those connections to uh, bigger policies or bigger uh, things going on in the world that can connect in relevant ways. I know in, in Canada, in my context, um, indigenization is really important in terms of supporting our all students, um, not just from equity, but for really encouraging um, our Indigenous students to feel like they have a voice and a place and a and an image <laughs> and a and a space. Um, so I think I liked the way you you integrated those kind of ideas. So thank you. Great. And I think Kathy, to your point about um, educators, you know, questioning, wow, can I can I really customize these materials? That's amazing. You know, again, it's like thinking about the audience mindset and educators have been using proprietary materials for so long. So OER really is a, is a completely different way of thinking about um, teaching and thinking about what's possible. And so saying many times you can customize, you can share, you can edit, like really explaining what that means. Um, is good messaging. It's it's not repetitive. It, it really is what what people need to hear. They really do need to understand what the benefits of OER are. Great. So we'll have more time for discussion at the end, but we should, in the interest of time, I think um, we'll talk a little bit about channels and, and different ways that OER messaging can be out in the world. Yeah, so we've now spent some time, you know, thinking about who we're talking to. We're talking, we have thought about, you know, what we're going to say. And so now um, we can focus in on some of the tools that are at our um, disposal for how, right? So how would we get, um, these messages out. And so, um, you know, we wanted to, to show kind of um, some of the world in which we, we work, right? Um, and to be sure that when we're thinking about advancing, you know, when you think about advancing your work and trying to um, kind of push the um, dialogue around OER forward, there really are a lot of different ways that can work um, really nicely together and complement each other. So conferences and meetings like this one, there's a host of digital tools, which we'll talk more about in a moment. Um, you know, Wikipedia, email, for what it's worth, you know, lots of folks think that email is passe. That is not the case. Um, you know, folks really rely heavily on email. Obviously, there's website communications, um, earned media, it's a fancy way of talking and saying, uh, if you're not familiar with that term, of working with journalists and reporters. Um, so really working to get stories placed. Um, social, so Twitter and LinkedIn, and Facebook, and you know, you name it. Um, we have paid media on here. So that is, you know, the art of placing um, advertising. Um, you know, some of you, you know, this may not be something that is in your, your toolbox yet, but we wanted to put it out there. Um, you know, Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, there are really cost-effective ways um, to 
target your audience. You know, if you have a big report coming out or a big um, release of some sort, um, there are ways that you can leverage those platforms to really um, discreetly hit the audiences you're looking for. Partnerships, um, you know, whether they are another researcher or another colleague or, you know, folks at a nonprofit or at a philanthropy looking at ways to do that handshake, right? Maybe having a blog appear on their site or um, having some other ways in which you work um, together in partnership to get your message out. So I think I don't have to um, convince anybody in this meeting. I think that, um, you know, offline activities are not the um, only way in which we're going to reach our audience. We really have to be very intentional and focused um, on online activities, digital challenge um, channels. Um, Jamie's going to talk to us more about Wikipedia, but, you know, that really is the online encyclopedia, right? Like that is a, a trusted resource that folks have. So thinking about OER um, as a place to, to share information um, or thinking about Wikipedia as a way to share information about OER is incredibly important. Um, being intentional about email, your website, your social and those partnerships, you know, in terms of that blog sharing. Um, you know, digital reputation is the same as your reputation. Um, you know, for those of us that have been around for, for quite a while, that didn't used to be the case, you know. Um, but now, you know, a quick Google will search will show you um, kind of give folks an, an immediate impression. And that impression, do you want to be sure that you're really thinking about perception um, and kind of what the information is out um, about your work? Um, and about the work that uh, you're doing with others, you know, what that looks like online. Um, we used a tool called SparkToro to generate the, um, the example, uh, you know, the little graph below. So basically this is a tool that um, can search on a, a number of, of way, in a number of ways, but we used a couple hashtag searches. And this is not just a domestic tool, this is a, a global tool. So um, all of this is just to show that there is room to grow for OER. So the hashtag OER is used um, really consistently in the, the community and has high use, um, which is wonderful. But when you compare it to a hashtag like education, you can just see how much room there is to grow. And importantly, and something that Kelsey and, our, and I and our work do a lot, is like how do we cross pollinate? How can we bring OER more into the conversation um, that is the more general education conversation so that we can get more folks thinking and talking about OER? That's something that we work on um, a lot and are, are working to be very intentional about. So again, the tool, if, if folks are interested, is called SparkToro that, that we use to generate that graphic. So we want to you know, wrap up here. We've just got a couple slides left was this notion, um, you know, we frequently get in the, the weeds of our work and we are frequently talking to people that understand our shorthand um, and the, the value, the implicit value that something like OER has. Um, and wanted just to take a moment to come back up a bit here to really think about that audience and how our minds are story processors, not logic processors. We can use um, hard and fast data to kind of punctuate our points, but really um, any audience needs to be told a story. So we have a few examples here of just how that is done, you know, that's been done in the OER space. Um, so what you'll see is a variety on this screen. So testimonials, so firsthand, views of OER and which we'll see in the upper left, right? How did OER make a difference in their life? Um, on the right hand side, you know, using blogs. Um, so, you know, the uh, New England Board of Higher Education has a fellowship program um, for OER. And, you know, it's her perspective as a practitioner about what the textbook shortage has meant to her students, right? So still putting that student center, having a practitioner, a trusted voice, um, talking about the value of OER, and then of course using video um, in the lower left. So Open Syed is a, an open um, science platform and using students and 
the um, and their voices in the context of a video montage. So lots of different ways, but at the, the core of it, it really is striving to tell those stories in an impactful way that, that can leave an impression with your audience. So with that, we, um, we would just love to hear more from you. Um, if any questions that you may have, I'm trying to, we can go back to our list to make sure that we, you know, hit on um, the questions that were surfaced at the beginning, but we'd love to, to hear from you all. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Kelsey, that was fantastic. Um, just to say to people that I can um, pass the microphone to you as well. So if you do want to speak and use the mic, let us know and I'll um, activate that for you. One question while we're waiting um, for Mark to come in that was raised at the top of the call uh, that I think would be helpful to circle back to is um, Martin questions Martin's question about um, the balance between responding to negative stories and concerns about OER versus promoting the benefits. And I think when it comes to earned media, to the news media, something that's that's published um, by a reporter, generally, what we recommend is um, absolutely correcting misinformation, inaccuracies. If the reporter is saying something about OER or representing you or, or maybe misquoted you in, in some way that's not accurate, it is, it's completely appropriate and um, the reporter should take it very seriously to correct an inaccuracy. So sending in that, that tip um, and asking nicely for a correction is a really good thing to do. If it's really more about a different perspective um, or opinion on OER, you know, maybe versus uh, proprietary materials, what we found is rather than going directly to that author and kind of engaging in that argument, um, what is more effective is trying to get out the positive messaging, um, maybe in the same publication, um, but also just seeding it elsewhere, um, not as a direct response to say a negative article, but really just as counter information, um, helping readers get additional perspective, think about it in a different way. Um, and that can can be done very well without having to say, my op-ed is in response to you know this article, or I saw this this article and now I'm posting on, on social media in response. And in some cases that's not necessary, really just sharing the positives of OER is helpful to um, create that conversation and, and try to angle it um, uh, to the benefits, to um, the messaging around why it's important for students and teachers. Thanks, Kelsey. I think that uh, I've got the mic. There's an interesting thing about you know, we in GoGM, we sort of, you know, uh, we're scholars of OER and stuff. So often people in their research are critical of OER, critical of aspects of openness and those kind of things, which is perfectly legitimate. You know, I, I, I don't think we want to sort of create a, a culture where you know, it's kind of a group thing and we only say, you're only allowed to say these things. Um, but I think that's very different to when you're communi communicating with a, with a wider audience who don't know, probably don't know sort of all, all the kind of details of the thing. I think a lot of people in our community the benefits of OER and that are kind of taken for a given, and now that's kind of exploring very kind of specific details. Whereas I think it's a different thing about if you're communicating to a different audience. I think sometimes nuancing those, those different messages is important for for researchers like we have here. So I, I see uh, Verena's got questions. Yeah, and if I can just add one um, other kind of nuance to that, because Martin, I think you're right. You know, in academic circles, you you certainly, um, you know, want to be responsive to challenges or thoughts that, um, you know, may be surfacing around OER and you don't want to, um, you know, sugarcoat that. I think frequently in more, in, uh, either in educator more broadly, you know, publications and even more general publications, if there is a piece that is critical of OER that comes out, 
you know, we have certainly seen, um, it's not unique to the OER community, but we have certainly seen an impulse to be like, I'm going to do a point by point refutation, right? This is inaccurate. The challenge with that approach is that you're giving more airtime to the critiques that the person had by repeating them. And then you're potentially giving those same critiques a wider audience by doing the point by point. So that is why our council will always be, um, you know, kind of look for, you know, certainly if there's blatant inaccuracies, have those corrected. Um, but take that moment, that opportunity to instead focus on the benefits, the classroom examples, the, um, you know, the quality notions. So like that, um, that is where the, the time is best spent. And it can be tough, right? Because if somebody attacks or there's a feeling of being attacked, you want to say, no, that's not right. And here's all the reasons why that's not right. Um, but it's really needing to take a step back and see where, where's the best use of our time um, to get the, um, the most positive messages out about who we are as we can. So we have a Marina. I'm echoing. Let's see if I can stop that. Um, so Verena is thinking about messaging around um, open learning and and really beyond just the materials, um, pedagogical approaches. Michelle, do you have thoughts on that question? Sure. So we, um, you know, we haven't researched open pedagogy specifically yet. Um, that is certainly on on deck for us to do. Um, but I will say that the same sorts of ideas will apply in terms of, um, you know, that the, the special sauce, secret sauce of, of openness is this notion of high quality work available to anyone. Um, and that is something like you, you saw that as the lead message and the, the message block that, that Kelsey shared um, when it comes to OER. Uh, the reason why you know we lead with that is because that is something that is a differentiator that traditional publishers and others really can't touch, right? Like this is designed, our, we, our reason for being how we came here is because high quality work deserves to be for everyone. And so that notion um, can apply to open pedagogy for sure. Um, and I think kind of leaning into that is, is going to be helpful. And I also think um, importantly, keeping students at the center and then um, not having it be a silver, silver bullet. Because when it comes to pedagogy, you know, there's, there's, there's time. There is time spent. There um, has to be work that's done. Um, the thing of it is, I think, is just it's just a different type of work than educators may be used to doing. Um, but I think not shying away from the work uh, is important. Great. And in the chat, everyone um, is saying that in Ghana, OER is, is still very new and looking for ideas about where to start when, when trying to build awareness of OER. Um, one thing that I would say, there's so many different ways to tackle this, um, but one thing I would say is, Evelyn, really thinking about um, who the primary audience might be. So whether it's in K through 12 or higher education, who are the decision makers? Um, who, who has the power to make changes when it comes to the types of materials being used in classrooms or, or the way that teachers are teaching? So is it the educator? themselves or is it um, the administration? Maybe it's more of a top-down approach. So I think it's it's important obviously that educators are experiencing the materials and starting to see the benefits, but they might not have, have the power to bring OER into their classroom. So um, I truly don't know what the answer is in, in Ghana, but but I would, 
you know, say, consider thinking about that, about you can't necessarily reach everyone off the bat. So who might be the most helpful audience to start with um, to really bring them on board um, and have them start thinking and, and using OER. Um, and then they can hopefully start to spread the word and, and awareness will grow from there. And then the one thing I would add while we're waiting for the questions to come in is um, thinking about that slide that Michelle showed where you have all of the different communications channels at your fingertips, thinking creatively about how you can use um, a website to spread awareness. What could you do with social media? Of course, Wikipedia is, is going to be important. Um, maybe you're interested in, in joining Jamie's course, um, but really just thinking expansively about all the different ways that you might be able to reach educators um, in that country. So I will say, Michelle may have mentioned this at the top of the call when I was having my technical issues. Um, we have an OER messaging guide that um, does detail the guiding principles I shared at the top of the call and has some sample messaging. Um, and maybe you have already seen it, but if not, please feel free to reach out to Martin or Jamie, uh, excuse me, Martin or Beck, and um, they can share it with you or they can, of course, put you in contact with Michelle and I. Um, so we do have that, that physical guide that may be helpful. Yes, and of course, reach out with questions. Michelle just uh, put our emails in the chat, so do not hesitate to reach out. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Michelle and Kelsey. 